Greetings, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Plan B Success. We have Sid Mohasab today, all the way from Los Angeles, California. Now, Sid is a published author, a serial entrepreneur, venture investor, university professor, board member, business thought leader, and a public speaker. The most interesting fact, Sid is also an immigrant. He moved to the U.S. about 40 plus years ago from Iran. His book, You Are Not Them, is releasing today. And here we are having a conversation about Sid, his background, his life in general, where he's been and where he's going. So welcome, Sid. Thank you for having me. It's great to be uh, to be with you, particularly, as you said, it's the day that my new book is uh, is released. So tell us in your own words uh, a little bit about yourself. Uh, well, as you mentioned, uh, I am uh, an immigrant. I came to the United States about 40 some years ago and uh, uh, by myself and uh, basically went to school and uh, and started uh, uh, and started working i started my first business when i was in college uh and then uh, started a career in consulting became a partner of a consulting firm um basically working with very large organizations uh, then uh, started uh, uh, on my own uh with the, the objective of buying companies and turning them around uh, did that and along the way identified a number of uh, uh, companies to start as startups mostly in technology uh, and uh, and that kind of kick started my journey into uh, investing as an early stage investor uh, and uh, and basically uh, I've uh, as you mentioned I've started multiple companies I've turned around companies uh, and in the past uh, a few years after I sold the company to KPMG and was the uh, the national innovation lead for the strategy group there, uh, I have been uh, doing three things. I, I teach at uh, USC, University of Southern California, both in the engineering school and in the business school. Uh, I do a lot of writing, a uh, lot of lot of articles, and uh, and I recently did my second book, uh, as mentioned earlier. Which is called "You Are Not Them," uh, the uh, authentic on way. Uh, so uh, uh, basically, I do uh, writing, I do teaching, and I do investment and advisory work, and that's kind of uh, three pillars of what uh, what I do now. And have you always been in in the West Coast? Uh, I have. Uh, I I was originally for about a year. Uh, in a in a small town called Danville, California, and then uh, and then moved to uh, L.A. and uh, was in Orange County uh, area for a little bit, but basically in Southern California. Yeah. So when you look back, right, you've been uh, there for a pretty long time. So you pretty much saw the whole the Silicon Valley formation and growth and all that stuff, right? That is correct. Uh, you know the whole startup scene has uh, has changed and evolved considerably uh, originally if you would the idea of investing in early stage and, and this is going back probably 30 years ago uh was uh it was smaller amounts of money mm -hmm. and uh, you would then uh, you would then hope that you would uh, you would exit through selling the company or stay with the company for a long time uh, and then the idea of an exit uh, came and got attached to this IPO notion. Uh, and that changed the dynamics because then people were pushing uh, to get things bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And as a result, more funding was needed. And as a result, the uh, venture capital firms became bigger and bigger. Uh, and now to a point that you see all of these... Uh, uh, unicorns, which are worth over a billion dollars, funds, uh, that are, uh, in the billion plus ranges, um, and, uh, and there are gaps now in investments that are uh, not conducive necessarily to, uh, the very early stage, uh, entities. Mm -hmm. So there's been quite a bit of change. Yeah. 
And then, you know, your your journey it seems like you actually were a part of several companies, mostly around data analytics and such, uh, including the last one, I believe, uh, the one that you talked about, uh, KPMG, that got acquired, right? Correct. So uh, I, I come from uh, uh, the belief that data uh, can lead us to insight. Uh, before, uh, I, my, my father, I used to joke around with him, uh, I studied operations research when I was going to school, uh, which is the less sexy name for a data scientist. Mm-hmm. Um, and at that time, my father used to say, what is this you're studying? So about 20 years later, I was talking to him and I said, hey, you know what's that, what I studied is now pretty, pretty hip. It finally caught up with us. Uh, so I've had a, a belief in the value of data uh, and almost everything that I have done in terms of evaluating companies, finding opportunities, uh, and even strategically applying analytics in one form or shape uh, has been with me throughout my, uh, uh, throughout my career. Actually, my first book, which is called The Caterpillar's Edge, uh, which, which uh, is, is centered around this idea that evolve evolve again and thrive in business uh, has a lot of uh, references or a lot of uh, focus on how data analytics is, is changing the world, how AI is changing the world. And that was, uh, you know, a few years back uh, and it centered around that idea. So uh, I, I am a believer. I teach uh, data analytics consulting at the engineering school. I also have come up with the idea of what I call dynamic strategy. Uh, or exertive strategy, which is a combination of corporate strategy and, and analytics. Um, today, strategies are a lot more temporary than they used to be. This idea that we have a five, 10 year plan, it's okay to have a 10 year plan, but you have to be ready to change it uh, fairly, fairly quickly. And how do you change it? Uh, is not like a lifetime uh, event in, in, in pivoting. Uh, it has to be the organization and the strategy has to designed around this idea that our strategy is dynamic and is always constantly evolving of having a portfolio of strategies, a wave of strategies, uh, and being able to connect execution uh, to the way we um, we deliver value and uh, uh, and the company's ability to always stay, uh, stay relevant, both to customers, to partners, uh, to society, and of course, to, uh, to employees. So in your mind, you know, when you look at uh, the startup scene today, you know, of course, it's a little different with uh, COVID-19 and what happened. And, you know, that has actually shifted our focus a little bit to other things besides always, you know, chasing the next big dream. But in your mind, when you look at what the happenings around and when you, when you look at what's going on for the next 10 years, what do you believe would be the focus of startups? <laughs> Uh, so let me, let me tell you, uh, one thing. I work with a number of startups that I'm an investor in and I'm fairly involved with them. I get fairly close, uh, as opposed to some investors that are relatively hands off. Uh, most of the companies that I work for, despite this COVID-19 and the challenges, have been able to find their way through these challenges and, and evolve. Uh, Crisis, as the Chinese put it, put it, uh, the Chinese have two characters that represents when you put them together, it, it represents crisis. One is danger, the other one is opportunity. So in any crisis, there's plenty of opportunities to be explored. Uh, because, uh, because we get more focused, uh, because we have to leave our, our addictions to the past and the day, the, 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 the comfort of how we were doing in the past is, is challenged. Uh, leadership is more crystallized. And, um, and essentially the balance between risk of doing something versus risk of doing nothing is, uh, is challenged. So there's lots of opportunities, I believe, uh, ahead of us. Now, I, I, I wrote an article recently for, uh, uh, London School of Economics. Uh, around this idea of, uh, of, of C generation or the Corona generation. As you know, <clears throat> we have had the uh, millennials and the, uh, you know, the, 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 the X generation and all that different, mm-hmm. uh, different ways that people define 
um, different groupings of uh, of generations that are people born. Uh, I believe that uh, there is uh, this understanding, and this is not a age related. It's not people who are born at this time. It's people who have uh, been in the workplace uh, during this time. Mm-hmm. So it could be from 16 or 17 all the way uh, up, but mostly through you know the 40s. This generation has been faced with this idea that they need to uh, they need to trust themselves more, and they can't just wait for trickle down uh, economics for people to give them jobs because that may not be there. Uh, so they have uh, this uh, this desire, I think, to be more entrepreneurial. Uh, so I believe the next generation. Uh, is the uh, the generation for the entrepreneurs for innovation uh, because some of the old challenges old uh, ways of doing things have been challenged it, you know take across all the different industries from uh, from the groceries and retails to uh, people buying things online to uh, medical and uh, telemedicine uh, to the way we even discover vaccines and uh, and, and biometrics uh, kind of stuff. Uh, across the board, uh, there's lots and lots of opportunities uh, to evolve and to change. And uh, and change is is where uh, where entrepreneurs uh, actually uh, excel. So uh, that's kind of a segue into talking about my new book uh, because it's very relevant. It's uh, it, the, the the essence of it is that uh, we are all entrepreneurs. And uh, I, I set that up as, as proving to you that we are all entrepreneurs. We always exchange something that we have with something that is better. That doesn't matter uh, who we are or what domain we do that. <clears throat> it may be that we work somewhere and we get a paycheck and we try to create happiness for our family. That is exchanging our time and effort and intelligence in order to get something back. That is the essence of, of entrepreneurship. Uh, we could apply it in different ways. We, some of us are in denial. Some of us are not. The, the key thing is obviously not all of us are, are the Elon Musks of the world. Uh, we're not them. Uh, and that's why the, the name of the book is You're Not Them. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's finding your own philosophy and your own approach that allows you to tap into what I call an inherent talent that you have as an entrepreneur. So what I see the future uh, in the next 10 years, it's, it's filled with entrepreneurship and desire, uh, to, uh, to do better, to, uh, you know, entrepreneurship is about pursuit of happiness, essentially. Uh, where it would, what industries, I think it would be broad based, uh, but it would be mostly fueled with technology. So, you know, we live in a capitalistic society. And, you know, I do know that you're known as the entrepreneur philosopher is what they call you. So, let me ask you this question. Capitalism, for that matter, or the pursuit of entrepreneurship and startups is always measured in dollars, right? It's always measured in dollars. Every single headline you pick up, it's about a company getting that next round of funding. Uh, very few talk about profitability at all. You know, at a point in time, it was the fundamental, the fundamentals of business. Now they have shifted. But now with COVID coming in, which was a pretty curious thing for me, because I wanted to see how businesses would behave, and they actually stepped up. They actually put, uh, you know, money on the back burner and said, "We got to take care of our people. People need to work from home and all that." And and now I think we're slowly but surely coming out of uh, you know the, the pandemic situation. Hopefully in the near future. But when you see all this and the way I've kind of put it uh, in terms of my observations. What's your thought process and, and how do you think it will evolve in the future? So let me challenge one assumption that you said that people put profits on the back burner by having people work from home. Uh, they had no choice. They needed to deliver the value. And if people had to work from home, they had to work from home. So they had, they were, they were forced to create something that would be conducive to continue, uh, continue work. But, uh, here's, here's, uh, here's my philosophy. I think, um, now this may be a little controversial. <laughs> uh, I think that we have lived in a, a society, uh, that has turned capitalism into elitism. 
capitalism is not about a few people having a lot of money or big companies and mm-hmm. then trickling down to the rest of us. That's socialism. Now, mm-hmm. whether the government gives us uh, money or the government gives it to the big players through tax uh, benefits, uh, through all sorts of policies that would then uh, the, the Amazons of the world or the big companies will give us jobs and basically take care of us. That's not capitalism. I call that elitism. Mm-hmm. Now, we have been in, in that mode for a number of years, and that's not where the core competency of America was. Mm-hmm. It is the individual entrepreneurs, uh, the, 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 the mom and pop shops, the, all the, all the little things that we built. And it is, uh, if you look at the statistics, uh, from Kaufman Foundation and, 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 and other places, the Venture Capital uh, Association and so forth, almost one in a thousand entrepreneur who is looking for quote unquote funding, uh, mm-hmm. it's not going to their dad and, and, and having them help them or their mom help them or, or their cousins. It's really looking for funding. One in a thousand gets that money. Mm-hmm. And if you look at who becomes a, 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 a you know a, a big a big player and makes a lot of money in millions and millions? It's one in a million. That's one in a thousand, and then another one in a thousand would would get that. Majority mm-hmm. of the companies don't uh, don't start up, don't work. Majority of them, even if they work, will provide two or three x of uh, of returns. And then there's a very little uh, a group, a small percentage that actually make the breakouts. However. We have uh, the media and the people, which in, in a sense, you know, it's, it's less interesting to talk about, uh, you know, Joe who has a small business and, uh, and feeds 11 people with that business. It's much more interesting to talk about, uh, you know, Mark Zuckerberg who has billions or, or, or Elon Musk who made $150 billion in a year. It's more mm-hmm. interesting. But I believe that the, the, that the future is going to have to for us to succeed is going to have to, uh, we have to change the way we approach it. And that is going from a trickle down approach to a bubble up approach. And a bubble up approach is very aligned with what I was saying that I think the entrepreneurship will be back. It is, it is not necessarily a Silicon Valley type of entrepreneurship that everybody becomes a, uh, a big company and, a, and, and an IPO exit. It's the roots and the core competency of America. And, uh, and and the idea that we all have the ability to control our destiny, to own things, to build things, and to prosper. So, you know, coming to the thought that every individual is an entrepreneur and, you know, individuals are entrepreneurial in nature and they need to look into themselves in order to bring it out. You know, it's it's said that money attracts money, right? So... Getting from uh, uh, from zero or a dollar to a million is the big journey. And then once you get to that million, making it two million, you know, sounds much easier or simpler. It may not be simpler, but definitely easier. And a lot of people are caught up in the zero to a million dollar journey, whether as individuals, whether as corporations, whatever it might be. In your mind, what are the things that they need to focus on? If, if it's somebody who's actually trying to build personal wealth, versus somebody who's just started a company and is looking to get to that $1 million mark. What do they need to focus on in order to crack that? Okay, so <clears throat> this is perhaps part of the reason that uh, that uh, people call me the philosopher as opposed to a how-to guy. So let me explain what I believe. I believe the first thing to do is to acknowledge that you're an entrepreneur before mm-hmm. anything else. Mm-hmm. And by acknowledging it, and it's, I, I give people a very simple test. It doesn't matter where you are, what you do. I like you from tomorrow morning, every decision that you make, think about it. You're taking a risk. You're making a left turn or a right turn. You're uh, deciding to stay another hour uh, at work or, uh, or go uh, to a baseball game, which unfortunately we can't do now, but <laughs> to your son's baseball game. That's mm-hmm. a choice. That is a choice. So everything we do has choices, and where there are choices, there are consequences, and where there are consequences, there are risks involved in this process. So we are actually making entrepreneurial decisions. And if we do that, 
we we first have to admit that we are an entrepreneur. Now, the question is, if you look at out there, Warren Buffett is very different than Bill Gates, very different than Henry Ford, very different than the Rockefellers. They're all different. They're not the same. Their definition, their view of risk, their their their, their beliefs, they're all different. So who am I philosophy in approaching either from zero or a million, doesn't matter, mm-hmm. or a hundred million? Mm-hmm. The journey kind of continues. I'll say, you know, we're all sculptor and the sculptor of our lives. We build, we choose, we evolve, and we're never perfect. We're always uh, in, in pursuit of something different. So now the key elements to look at, one is is risk. What is our risk profile? What is our risk appetite? And that changes over time. It's not the same. So uh, I suggest people, I said, think of yourself as a pilot. For one thing, a pilot has, uh, a commercial pilot has a very defined risk parameter that check the engine, check the weather, check this, check that, and then they fly. But they take a risk every day. And millions of them are taking risks all around the globe every day. Now, uh, here's a question. Who takes more risks? The pilot? Or the, uh, or the, uh, uh, or the passenger. I would say the, the passenger put the passenger. his, the passenger put uh, their life in the pilot's hands. I think they're exactly right. <laughs> so the risk taken is exactly the same for both parties. Now, there are some times that we choose to fly with somebody because we think they're better. Now, that gets into the heart of Entrepreneurship. Sometimes I hire somebody who knows A, B, C better than I do. Not all leaders. That that goes to the heart of leadership. We delegate. Mm-hmm. We don't have to be on the front seat all the time. That's the way we 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 start forming our risk tolerance. And where do I lead? And where am I the pilot? And where am I not the pilot? Now, the harsher the process gets, if you would, if you take an entrepreneur, you may say, well, this is really not a commercial pilot where it goes from point A to point B every day, it's uh, more like a fighter jet pilot that is not only faced with regular flying uh, risks, uh, they're shooting at him. Mm -hmm. And is challenged with how much fuel he has. And she's uh, challenged with with competition and and others, uh, you know, trying to take him down. So it becomes even a more... Uh, interesting dynamics of this. Now, the other thing that I would, I would say is the ability to create what I call your oceanness, your ecosystem. Now, that ecosystem could be seven people or could be 7,000 people. It's the ability to act like an ocean, create an ecosystem. An ocean does the following things. First, it's a provider to every species that lives within it. It's a connector. It connects all these pieces together. It creates energy in different forms of waves. So having an ecosystem is a critical thing. Who do I work with? What do I do? And then you get into other things like uh, the leadership and authenticity of who you are and having the courage to push past things. Creating trust is an important element. Now, I started with nothing. And I always said that people say, what's the greatest thing that you've had? I'll say trust. People trusted me. But that trust had to do with execution, with the ability to deliver, with honesty. Entrepreneurship has a scale. And on one end, there's this group I call misguided, who think that by talking fast and bamboozling, a lot of us, oh, those are entrepreneurs. They're not entrepreneurs. They're shysters. So you have you have to be able to act like a pilot and understand your risk profile, you have to understand the, and build your crit, your your ecosystem. Doesn't matter how big that is. Uh, you have to learn how to dance. As I, as, you know, people use pivot, but I call I call it dancing because it's really you're you're always faced with a timing element. You're always faced. It's not like uh, you know it's always the same way and all you know all of a sudden you have to pivot. That's the old world. If we're if we're moving this fast, we're always dancing with the music with what is relevant to customers. And that's changing all the time because people's desires and expectations are wonderfully changing. They expect more, and they should. Mm -hmm. And we should expect more as an entrepreneur. So if you take all of those elements together, and then you have to have the ability to be mindful about things, be aware of things, be there constantly. 
to understand what pains you may be able to serve because that's essentially how uh, how any business works. If I can understand anything out there that is a pain or a need by others, I can turn that pain or a need into an exchange of relieving that pain by providing something that I build or I have, be it my thoughts and energy or be the product. And by doing that, that exchange becomes a business. That's very well put. So I'm going to shift gears here. And since we are on the topic of risk, take you back several years when you actually came into the country as an immigrant. I'm an immigrant myself. And I still remember the day fresh in my mind when I landed here with two suitcases and about a hundred dollar bill in my pocket. You know, that's where most of us started. So when you look back, you know, when you came here, did you come here to study? Is that how you came into the country? Yes, I, uh, I, I came here to study. Uh, I came from Iran, uh, and uh, a few years before the revolution in Iran, uh, I came by myself and I'm not sure if I was at that point considered smart, a genius or a stupid guy who left the country that everything was well. Uh, I did not have any forewarnings about a revolution that was coming to Iran, but, uh, I had, a a, 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 a I guess a desire, if you would, uh, to, uh, to grow. And I thought that, uh, uh that this, uh, country would provide me with those opportunities. That's probably one of the biggest risks you had taken in your life. Uh, potentially, yeah. Uh, particularly, let me make that even riskier. Particularly because I have a genetic disease called hemophilia, which is a blood disease, a blood disorder. Uh, which requires a lot of attention. Uh, and if I bleed or even have any sorts of injuries, internal or external, uh, could lead to uh, disastrous outcomes. So that added to uh, that, uh, that risk. But I think that also has helped me uh, to be humble about things. And uh, I had a conversation with uh, with someone a while ago, and he said, if you look at, uh, some uh, people who have been able to push through challenges, they've always had uh, some sort of uh, a pain that they have overcome uh, that uh, strengthens their character. For me, uh, it was when I was accomplishing, it was, hey, I can even do it uh, without, if I can beat that, I can beat this, that kind of an attitude. Uh, now, that doesn't mean that everybody uh, who needs to be successful, we've got to give them some sort of a disease. <laughs> uh, it, it just means that you can use whatever, uh, mental, uh, if you would, power that you have, uh, to reinforce your, uh, your desires because desire itself is just not sufficient for growth. There's hard work to do. Uh, there is the ability to change and evolve that, that comes into play. Uh, there is, uh, there's the ability to build trust, as I said in, in, in previous uh, ways. And, uh, and, and, you know, that's, that's part of the, uh, that's part of evolving, whether you're in Wisconsin, uh, or you come from, from another country. It's, uh, I believe it's the same. And then when you look back at your life, what do you think you're most thankful for? What am I most thankful for? Um, I think, I think, uh, it's been the ability of, uh, of people trusting me, uh, uh, and, and I, I don't mean that, uh, just in, in business and, uh, for, for my wife to trust me, for her family to trust me, for my father and mother to trust me when I wanted to come to the United States, uh, for people who have trusted me with their, uh, with their money in terms of investing, uh, for employees that uh, have trusted me at various points, uh, even when we had serious cash flow issues and, you know, I'd gone out there and say, Hey, uh, here's the challenge. Uh, can we rise up to the challenge and trust me? We'll get you there. Uh, who trusted me and, and and put their beliefs in me? So I think that is the most valuable thing that uh, that I've been uh, that I can I can mention. And what do you look forward to in the future? Uh, I have a belief, and you can see from the body of work that I've done uh, that uh, there is a great. There's great opportunities ahead in terms of entrepreneurship. Uh, and I think I have done a lot of stuff, uh, in my days. Uh, and I think it's the gener- next generation. And I hope, 
uh, to be an influencer in some form or shape uh, in influencing people uh, where it matters, which is provoking the mindset. Nobody can motivate people except people themselves. Uh, so I hope to be able to provoke people uh, to embrace this idea that we are all entrepreneurs and to embrace uh, uh, this idea that uh, that uh, change is good uh, because without change, there's really no choice. Uh, imagine if there was everything was the same all the time. It was spring. It was winter. Uh, you were at the, in college or you graduated or you're uh, the uh, the same exact things would happen. You will eat the same food every day. If there was no change, none of those things would have happened. There would have been any alternative. There wouldn't be prosperity. So accepting that change is not only not our enemy, but it's actually our best friend because it provides us with choice. So what my hope is in terms of me is, is to be able to play a role uh, to provoke people to uh, to accept that reality and then uh, basically tap into their talents and, uh, and 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 get ready to evolve and for people that want to connect with you and uh, want to get a copy of your book uh, how do they reach you uh, my uh, contact is pretty simple it's sid s i d at mohasseb my last name m o h a s s e d and uh, um, that's my email. Uh, my site, general site is mohasib.com, which is my last name.com. And from there, my various activities and businesses are clear. As for the book, it's on Amazon and it's called You Are Not Them. And, uh, uh, and they can, they can get it directly in various forms that they have available. Sid, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been a pleasure talking to you, learning about your life times and your views as the entrepreneur's philosopher. I'm sure a lot of people would be intrigued to look into your book and to get in touch. We wish you the very best and hope to keep in touch. Thank you so much, uh, Reggie, for the opportunity. And I hope if people uh, get the book and read the book, uh, they drop me a note about their perceptions and uh, good or bad and, and what they thought, uh, because that, uh, to be honest, is the greatest motivator uh, for, for a writer. I also tell my students that Wherever you go, uh, write me a note because that is the reason that uh, that I do that. And that's the greatest uh, reward that, that I can get. And please don't uh, um, don't starve me from <laughs> from that reward. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Hey, I hope you liked that episode. Please do check out Plan B Success Podcast on your favorite listing platforms. It's also available on www.planb.live. If you're looking to learn how to podcast and learn everything there is to ideate, create, launch, and monetize a podcast, do get in touch through the website www.planb.live. And I'll be more than happy to help. Thank you very much. Mm-hmm.